I just wanted to produce a short video introducing the concept of the Divine Council. A subsequent video will get into this a little bit more with the Divine Council worldview, which focuses a lot on Deuteronomy 32. You're going to have to be familiar with the Divine Council and, again, the worldview of, the, of biblical theology associated with it, uh, because, again, I'm not going to be stopping to explain everything, uh, explain this concept and what stems from it in uh, my weekly sessions on Naked Bible Podcast. So it's going to really help if you have this in your head, you understand it, at least again to the brief extent that I presented it here, because I will build on it uh, in those other weekly installments. So let's just jump in here briefly. We're going to start in Psalm 82. This is sort of the go-to passage for the Divine Council. We read in Psalm 82, we're in the ESV, God has taken his place in the divine council. In the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. Now notice that God is in blue. I've clicked on it in my software. That's why the column here is blue. Underneath the word translated in English, God, is the Hebrew word Elohim. <clears throat> Nothing unusual here. Elohim is a very common term for God. If we go, though, to the second half of the verse, in the midst of the gods, he holds judgment. If we click on that and look and see what is in our Hebrew Bible, that is also the word Elohim. So two times you have the word Elohim in the same verse. The first occurrence has to be singular in translation because this verbal, it's a participle, has taken his place or taken his stand. It's singular, and so that requires the subject that goes with it to be translated singular. So God. But here, gods, that comes after the prepositional phrase, in the midst of. You can't be in the midst of one. It requires a plural. Plus, if we look down in verse 6, where God, this is the same psalm, Psalm 82, verse 6 now. God is addressing the members of his divine council, the members of the heavenly host. And he says, I said, you are gods. Click there again, Elohim. Sons, sons is obviously plural right here. Sons of the Most High, all of you. Again, it has to be plural. The second occurrence must be plural. There is nothing else it can be. And they're also not people. He says, nevertheless, like men, you shall die. And this isn't the normative thing that you would say to an Elohim. If we look here in Psalm 89, we see again that, again, the Elohim members of God's council back here, called the sons of God, the sons of the Most High. The Elohim members of God's council are not people. They are not human beings. But incredibly, that's what you're going to hear and see uh, in a lot of churches, study Bibles, commentaries, whatnot, especially if they're evangelical. They want to avoid the text at this point. This is why I like to take people to Psalm 89. Now, if you want a real detailed, lengthy refutation of what I'll call the human view of Psalm 82, again the cheating view. You can go to my website drmsh.com and click on the part where in the uh, scrolling window there for the Divine Council. You could go to www.thedivinecouncil.com and get lots of articles there that take you into all the, the gory details about why that view is incoherent. But I just like to take people to Psalm 89 because if you read it we have here the assembly of the holy ones. Okay, we know what that is. It's this divine council again. And guess what? It's in the skies. It's not on earth where people are. It's in the skies. And the psalmist asks, who among the heavenly beings is like Yahweh? Heavenly beings, B'nai Elim. Again, the divine council is in the spiritual realm. It is not on the earthly realm. It's in the heavens, quote unquote. Again, that, that language that the Bible uses for the spiritual place the spiritual world. Again, this is not a council of people running the affairs of the world from the spiritual world. It makes no sense at all and has absolutely no biblical support. But if you look at Psalm 82 and Psalm 89 here, you might start to think, well, that just sounds like a, a pantheon, like polytheism or something like that. Well, that's why I've devoted so much time to Psalm 82, to explain what's going on here. Now this slide just takes you through different occurrences, and we'll get to what's going on in Psalm 82 in a moment. But here you have, again, some of the same terminology, the B'nai Elohim, B'nai Elim, sons of God. You could click out to these passages 
we just go to Psalm 29, verse 1. Ascribe to the Lord, O heavenly beings. If we click on that, we've got B'nai Elim again. Ascribe to the Lord glory and strength. Again, the psalmist is demanding that the other inferior divine beings that are around, that he knows are real, that they worship the Lord, the unique Yahweh, the one who is superior and incomparable. Again, these beings are real. We're not talking about cartoon characters. Oh, worship the Lord, Batman or Superman, Donald Duck. Again, if you try to, to substitute what the text actually says, other spiritual beings in council, in an assembly or a host with God, taking orders from him, if you try to deny their existence and then just say, well, they're, you know, they're idols or something. Well, guess what, folks? There's, there's no group of idols in the skies, in the spiritual realm, taking orders from God. Other passages that have God creating the members of the heavenly host, the other gods. God is not an idol maker. They're not people, they're not idols, they're spiritual beings, and they're also not cartoons. They're real. Other passages have God among or above the Elohim or the Elim. Again, if these were just cartoon characters, it's not any item of praise to say God is greater than Mickey Mouse or Santa Claus. Okay, it just strips, it guts praise passages like in these Psalms here that glorify God above these other beings. If those beings don't really exist, it turns them into nothingness and, and absurdity. Let me click out here to Deuteronomy 32, 17. I think this will help make the point as well. Now, this is the Net Bible. We read, they sacrificed, they as the Israelites here in the context. This is a chapter in Deuteronomy 32, one of Moses' sermons to the Israelites about their history. They sacrificed to demons, not God. To gods they had not known. To new gods they had recently come along. Now, the first two of these... We have here, we have Shadim, demons. Again, these are regarded as real spiritual entities. Paul, in 1 Corinthians 10, quotes Deuteronomy 32, 17. When he talks about demons, he believes they're real. Okay? If you're not going to believe they're real, then you have to deny what Paul says. Paul was wrong. Well, he wasn't wrong. Okay? They sacrificed to demons, not God, Eloah. This should not be translated plural. Like they sacrificed to demons who are not gods. You have other translations cheat like this. Let's just go up to, let's go to the ESV. ESV has a poor translation here. They sacrificed to, to demons that were no gods. If I click on this, we have Eloah, which is a singular noun. It is always singular. This is a cheating translation. Again, to get away from what the, the, the Hebrew text obviously says. So if we go back to the Net Bible. The Net Bible does a great job with this. They sacrifice the demons, not God. There's the singular. That's what it should be. It's a singular noun. Eloah. It is always singular. Every word occurs in the Hebrew Bible, including here. So they sacrifice the demons, not God. To gods, this is also the word Elohim, they had not known. So it's very clear you have these demonic entities. Again, these Shadim is actually a term for like a guardian spirit. And we'll talk in our next video about why that word choice occurs here. But they're real spiritual entities that are hostile to God. And Paul referred to them as principalities and powers. If you don't believe they're real, well, then you might as well just chuck your New Testament, or at least every place that talks about the spiritual world. Okay? We're not going to cheat like that here. What about the incomparability of Yahweh, the God of Israel? I mean, what about all these statements, Mike? There's none besides me. There's none like me. Well, guess what? They're all true. The phrases are not denials of the existence of other Elohim, though. They are statements of the incomparability of Yahweh. Yahweh is different in some way, actually several ways. He is species unique among the Elohim. There are none like him. He is alone in what he is. But how do we know that? Well, there are passages that talk about incomparability. The denial statements, in fact occur in the same chapters as books that refer to other Elohim. Deuteronomy 4, Deuteronomy 32. We'd only need to look at Deuteronomy 32 because we just looked at verse 17 that has the gods as real spiritual entities. Well, those same passages have God saying things like, there's none beside me. It can't mean that the other ones don't exist. 
I actually like these two references in Isaiah and Zephaniah because the same denial phrases, you know, there's none beside me and all that, are used elsewhere, namely these two passages, where denial of existence just is not possible. Let's click out. You'll see what I mean. Here we have, go up here, get the context here. We have the Chaldeans. We're talking about Babylon. Okay, the Babylon is being addressed, and you come down here to verse 8, and Isaiah says, that Bab this is the way Babylon talks about herself. Who say in your heart, I am, and there's no one besides me. Well, it can't mean that there are no other cities on the planet, can it? It must mean that Babylon is saying, I'm incomparable. Okay, the, the, the point of the phrasing is not the denial of the existence of what you're comparing yourself to. It's the fact that you think you're incomparable. Same thing with Zephaniah, except here it refers to Nineveh. Again, denial of existence just isn't possible in these passages. So how do we understand all this? What about monotheism? Well, what we really have here is a cultural context problem, not a theological problem. And what I mean by that is monotheism as a term was actually coined in the 17th century. AD. It's a modern term that really doesn't adequately describe what an Israelite, an orthodox worshiper of Yahweh, the God of Israel, would believe. They couldn't deny the existence of other Elohim because they're right there in their own Bible. But at the same time, Yahweh was unique. There was none like him. So, so how do we do that? How would an Israelite who believed that Yahweh was unique, there is none like him, how would he articulate the relationship of Yahweh to the other Elohim? Well, the answer, again, to this is, is derivable from the text. I want to illustrate something to you first. I'll ask the question, who gets called Elohim in the Bible? Well, here's a list. God of Israel, of course, Psalm 82 and lots of other places. The gods of the Divine Council, we just saw that in Psalm 82. Gods of the nations like Ashtoreth, Chemosh, uh, Milcom, they all get called Elohim in the Hebrew Bible. Demons, we saw that. The disembodied human dead, we haven't looked at that one, but that's 1 Samuel 28, when Saul consults the medium at Endor, and she is able to uh, contact uh, Samuel, and Samuel comes up from the ground. The, the medium says, when, when she sees Samuel, she says, I see Elohim coming up out of the ground. And then Saul says, well, what does he look like? And she describes him, and he's like, yep, that's, that's Samuel. And Saul was correct. It was Samuel. How do we know that? Because Samuel speaks the word of the Lord to him after he comes up. He's a little grumpy. Why have you disturbed me? He, he reiterates what he had told Saul before in private conversation and about God's judgment, and it comes to pass. Okay, we know this is Samuel. Samuel, the disembodied Samuel, the dead Samuel, the Samuel in the, on the other side in the afterlife is referred to as Elohim. You also get angels, or I would say one particular angel is called Elohim in Genesis 35, uh, 1 through 7. The verb form is plural there. It mentions God. And if you go back to the context, Genesis 32, and look at Genesis 48, you know, I think that the, the best reason for the plural in Genesis 35, 7 is these events reference two beings who are both Yahweh, the angel and the invisible Yahweh himself. But anyway, here's the point. A person who knew their Bible, who was reading it in Hebrew, would know that Elohim is, here's the point, is not just used of one being. Elohim gets used of a variety of beings. Therefore, Elohim is not a word that is attached to a specific set of unique attributes. It can't be, because the, uh, the disembodied dead are not on the same attribute par level with the God of Israel. No one is. No thing is. But yet the biblical writers use the term of a range of beings. They didn't think of the term Elohim the way we think of the term G-O-D. 
See, when we see that, we immediately mentally assign a specific set of attributes to that, that word and then think, well, there can only be one of those. That is not the way the biblical writer thought about the term. The biblical writer heard Elohim and they didn't think of attributes. They couldn't because not all these beings share the same attributes. So what did they think of? This is what they thought of. Elohim is a term you would use of a being to describe where that being properly belongs. It is a term of residence. It is a realm related term. So in the spiritual world, there are many Elohim. There's God, Yahweh, and the Godhead. There are demons, there are disembodied dead, there are angels, there are gods of the council. All spiritual beings occupy the same realm, what we call the spiritual world. If you get labeled as Elohim, it just says that's where you belong. That's your proper domain. Now in that domain, Yahweh is unique. Yahweh is an Elohim, but no other Elohim is Yahweh. He is incomparable. This is what Elohim means to the biblical writer in biblical theology. Again, you're going to get you're going to have to get used to my stance on things like this. I don't care what tradition says. I don't care what theology books say. I don't care what the creeds say. I'm not anti any of those things. But none of them trump the text. The text is why we're here. The text is what's inspired. The text is what we look at. The text should be where we get our theology and nothing else. Now, let's talk a little bit about divine council hierarchy. We've got here, I use a pyramid shape, a nice triangle shape. We've got Yahweh at the top. Again, the members of the Godhead. Uh, I'm, in this video, I'm not going to get into the Old Testament uh, how the Old Testament displays or gives glimpses of the Godhead. Again, you can read my blog for that kind of thing, and we'll hit it in other ways too. Sons of God is actually sort of a rank term. Okay, Within the spiritual world, there is rank. All Elohim are over here, but there's Yahweh at the top, and then there's the sons of God, Malachim, what we think of as angels. This is actually a lower duty, a lower role. So they're all Elohim. But in terms of what they do and what they're responsible for, what their, what their spheres of authority are for, what their jobs are, Malachim, angel, is basically just a job description. There is hierarchy when it comes to what they do. So the Divine Council is where the cosmos is directed. It's where God issues decrees and gets things done, his, gets things accomplished. The council is really, again, made of all divine beings, but in biblical theology, all the way back to Eden, all the way to Revelation, the divine council will also, it was, it was originally intended to include believers. Okay? Again, in my book, The Unseen Realm, I, I devote a lot of space, a lot of pages to explaining this, that originally where God lived, Eden, is where God worked, he has a home office, Eden, and that's where humans were. The idea originally was God to dwell among his created beings, both on, our, you know, on earth, the ones on earth, humans, and his counsel with him. This is why we have plurals in Genesis 1.26. Let us create humankind in our image. God is speaking to his counsel, to his heavenly host. Hey, I want to create beings who are like me. You're already like me uh, in some way. Again, we shared attributes and you know that sort of thing because God shares attributes with us humans too. You know, we, we, this is just standard theology, Christian theology. There are communicable attributes. You know, some attributes we don't have, but uh, you know, most of them we, we have in a, in a small way. Well, God wants his divine family and his human family to be together, to live together, and to run his creation together, okay, to help him run the cosmos. This, this was the original intent. And of course, we know about the fall and how it was ruined. But the rest of the story of the Bible is how to restore Eden. This is why the book of Revelation ends with Eden again. And all these descriptions in the New Testament about believers, you know, to, to the, you know the, as many as received him to them, he gave the authority to become the sons of God. Well, that, that, the language is not accidental. Being a child of God is to be a member of God's family, which by definition means being a member of God's 
business, okay? What God is doing. So the council will ultimately include glorified, divinized, or angelified, or these are terms you read in the academic literature, uh, believers. And everybody's going to have their duty. You know, this, this whole notion about, what, you know, heaven is going to be a place where we sit around on clouds and play harps. It's just nonsense. It's not biblical at all. What we'll be doing is helping God run the new Eden, which is the entire earth, and enjoying it as originally planned. We'll have lots to do, lots to see, lots to experience. And where we get our notions is just somehow, you know, I think, just, just silly. You know, some of the things that we think about. We're not rooted in the text. Now, there are some council members who rebel. We learn that from Deuteronomy 32, Psalm 82, of course, Genesis 3, we have a divine being there who's in rebellion to try to get rid of humanity by having humanity sin. Again, we know all this. This is why we get uh, Shadim, really. Again, get a little ahead of ourselves, but I'll just mention it. Shadim is sort of a territorial guardian entity. Okay, and it's a geographical term, and we're going to see why in our next video, but it has a lot to do with how God views the earth, specifically after the Babel event. It's also why Pauline vocabulary is geographically rooted. Thrones, principalities, powers, these are all geographical rulership terms. This is not accidental. Divine governance. Okay, well what about the council? What do they do now? They're shared decision making in the divine council. If we go to 1 Kings 22, I mean they're not just sitting up there admiring God, even though I'm sure they could do that, but they have jobs to do. So this is the account of Micaiah, the prophet, uh, again with Jehoshaphat, uh, you know, trying to decide, should I go up with Ahab, you know, and to this particular battle, and, you know, they bring the prophets out, and they all say, oh yeah, go up, you're going to win, and, you know, Ahab, of course, doesn't trust his own prophets, Jehoshaphat has enough sense to ask, hey, isn't there a prophet of Yahweh around here somewhere, and Ahab says, yeah, there is, but I hate him. <laughs> Because he always, he never tells me anything I want to hear. And so they summon Micaiah. And Micaiah, you know, sort of mocks him. He, 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 he tries to make it sound, he mimics the, the previous prophets, the false prophets. Oh, yeah, go up there. You're going to do great. And the king of Israel says to Jehoshaphat at that point, didn't I tell you he would not prophesy good concerning me, but evil? He knows Micaiah is lying. He knows he's just trying, he's just being uppity, sarcastic. And Micaiah said, therefore, hear the word of the Lord. Okay, I'll tell you what, what's really going on. I saw the Lord sitting on his throne and all the host of heaven standing beside him on his right hand and on his left. And the Lord said, who will entice Ahab that he may go up and fall at remote Gilead? And one said one thing and another said another. Then a spirit came forward and stood before the Lord and said, I'll entice him. What's God's response? The Lord said to him, by what means? And he said, I will go out and I'll be a lying spirit in the mouth of all his prophets. And then God replies, God says, you are to entice him and you shall succeed. Go out and do so. Now this gives us a little, a little mirror into how God runs things. Does God need help? No. But he uses the beings he's created. Think about yourself. Think about us. Think about the church. Think about believers. Does God need us for evangelism? Does, does God need us to do anything? No, but he, he wants to use us because we're created like him. Again, this was the original intent to work for God, work with God. It's not a question of need. It's a question of this is what God wants. This is the way he wants it. And so you have an, a glimpse in 1 Kings 22 of how God runs things. God has decreed that Ahab is going to die. It's time for Ahab to go. And then he allows these lesser spirits, members of his heavenly host, to decide how to do the job. There's no question that Ahab's going to die. It is time for him to go. But God says, how do we want to do this? Now, if he would have heard a terrible idea, he would have said so. Well, that isn't going to work because God knows all things real and possible. But one steps forward and God allows him to participate. He says, I have an idea. Let's do this, this, this. And God says, yeah, that'll work. Go get it done. 
Again, not everything is decreed in stone. Okay, we'll come back to that thought. You get another instance here, divine participation by lesser beings in Daniel 4. We have here, let me make this a little smaller so we get a little more text on the screen. 4.13, we have here, <clears throat> I saw in the visions of my head as I lay in bed and behold a watcher, a holy one. Can one of these spiritual beings come down from heaven? He proclaimed loud and said, let's chop down the tree and lop off its branches. This is Nebuchadnezzar's vision of this tree. And he wants to know what his dream means. If we go down here, let's see here. We have a watcher and a holy one. Verse 17 says, again, when he tells him what it means, let, the, let his mind be changed from a man's, let, let a beast's mind be given to him. Nebuchadnezzar is going to go insane for a little bit, seven periods of time. And look at verse 17. The sentence is by the decree of the watchers. The decision by the word of the holy ones. So they, they had a part in coming up with this decree, coming up with this plan. Well, what, what's the point? To the end that the living may know that who rules? That the Most High rules the kingdom of men. I mean, they didn't arrive at this decision independently of God. I personally, I think it, it, it worked like 1 Kings 22 does. God decides something, time to punish Nebuchadnezzar, what are we going to do? You know, what do we think is appropriate? And he gets some ideas, not because he needs them, but because this is the way God wants it to work. He likes using his creatures. He likes using us. He likes using divine beings, too, who work for him. This dis the sentence is by the decree of the watchers, plural. Decision by the word of the holy ones, plural. Why? So that, that the Most High can be glorified. If we go down here to verse, oh, let's see here, right here. In verse 24, it says, it's a decree of the Most High. So here we see the, second, the other side of the coin. Again, God decrees, but yet his divine beings, the members of his council, have a genuine participatory role. We say, well, I thought everything was predetermined. No, I'm sorry, but it's not. You know, I shouldn't even have to show this passage because if you just think about the phrase, very familiar to theology books, you know, I want to say almost universally, but God knows all things real and possible. Well, that should tell you that if God only knows possible things, if God knows possible things that are not real, then those possible things cannot be predestinated because they don't happen. If you look at 1 Samuel 23, I'm not going to read through the whole story, but this is the, the kind of David and Kyla, or David at Kyla. God tells him, go down to Kyla, I will give the Philistines into your hand. You can read what the incident's about. And he goes to Kyla, does the job, and then Saul hears. Remember, Saul's been chasing David to kill him for years. Saul hears that David is in Kyla, and that's a walled city. And he thinks, I've got him now. There's no way to get out. I'm going to go down there. I'm going to surround the city. And I'm going to get David. Well, somebody, again, we're not told how Saul finds out. And we're not told how, you know, you know necessarily what, what the, the chain of information is. But someone gets wind of that Saul is coming down to Kyla, goes and tells David. And then David needs to, to talk to God. So David knew that Saul was plotting harm against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, bring the ephod here. Again, that's the, the, the tool by which you know, they would communicate with God, among other things, like Urim and Thummim. This is probably what the ephod means. The Urim and Thummim was in the, the priestly garment, the high priestly garment. Then David said, O Lord, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Kilah to destroy the city on my account. Will the men of Kilah surrender me into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Oh, Lord, you know, please tell me. And the Lord said, yep, he will come down. Then David said, will the men of Kyla surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, you bet, they will surrender you. So what does David do then? Verse 13, he leaves. He gets out of Dodge. He gets out of Kyla. Now, do you, do you realize what happened here? God foreknew two things in this passage. Yep, Saul's going to come down. Yep, he's going to turn you, the city is going to turn you over to Saul. God foreknows two things that do not happen. 
Therefore, foreknowledge does not necessitate predestination. If God foreknows all things real and possible, only the things that actually happen were predestinated. The things that don't were not. So foreknowledge does not necessitate predestination. You take that back, again, to some of these divine governance passages. God knows what's going to happen. God knows what's a good idea and what isn't. God knows who's going to say what and all this other stuff. But he lets the cosmos run. He gets his will done on earth and in heaven using the free agency of the intelligent beings that he has created. This is how God runs things. God runs things through his counsel, through unseen divine beings and human believers too. So who's missing from the diagram? This is our last slide, I believe. Uh, well, maybe not. Maybe I'll throw a couple others in here. We've got, uh, again, our council structure. Who's missing, though? Well, we don't have terms in this structure. I, deliberately, I didn't put them in. For cherubim, seraphim, and, of course, the Satan. And the Satan is a deliberate phrase because Satan is actually a, a title, a term. Uh, it means adversary. Uh, in the Old Testament, it's the, the term is actually not used of a, as a personal pronoun by rule of Hebrew grammar. Again, you could look that up on my blog as well. When we, you know, when we wind up running into Satan somewhere, and in, in, again, our weekly lessons will come back to this. Uh, otherwise, you could you could find it on my blog. Just put Satan into the search engine. Cherubim and seraphim; these are both guardian terms. One is Mesopotamian; it, it comes from the Akkadian karibu, and the other one is Egyptian. They're both actually the same thing. They're throne guardians. Uh, the terminology depends on, again, the, the, the context of the writing in the Hebrew Bible. Here's cherubim, kuribu, karib, karibu, again, depending on what dictionary you're using. Again, it's a throne guardian. We have the iconography. A little bit better there. Seraphim are also throne guardians, but it's Egyptian in flavor. It's not from the verb to burn. It's from the noun, you know, serpent or snake, saraf. I actually think it's a double entendre because it's probably uh, taken from cobra, uh, you know, the cobra iconography uh, from Egypt, and you had the spitting cobra, so you'd get the burning sensation if, if it hits you with its venom, and plus it was a serpent. But and again, I'm trying not to rabbit trail too much. Why do we get Egyptian imagery in Isaiah? Why do we get seraphim in Isaiah and not cherubim like we get in Ezekiel? Ezekiel, of course, is Mesopotamian in context. Uh, Isaiah is Egyptian in context. How do we know that? Because it was during his time period, Israelite kings actually used Egyptian iconography. They had, you know, they were on good terms with Egypt. The best example is Hezekiah. This is King Hezekiah's seal, discovered by archaeologists. It's a very obvious, very well-known Egyptian symbol. It says... Yehuda, Judah, and then we have Le, that's a Lamed for two or belonging to. We've got Kazakyahu, Akaz Melech, Hezekiah of Ahaz, Ahaz was his father, the king, Melech, king. Again, they, they just used, there was, a, there, there was a familiarity with Egyptian trappings, especially royalty, throne imagery, throne trappings. That's why we have seraphim in Isaiah 6. But anyway, that's a brief introduction to the Divine Council. I hope you'll move on to the Divine Council worldview video that's next.